Hello, and welcome to today's ACM 6 Soft webinar. This webcast is part of ACM 6 Soft's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM 6 Soft webinar series features speakers from the Future of Software Engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I'm Anita Sarma, Associate Professor at Oregon State University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. Before we start, here are a few housekeeping items. Today's talk is Gender in Open Source Software Development. The presentation starts at the hour and lasts 60 minutes. Slides will advance automatically through the event. You can resize the slide area as well as other windows by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide window, as well as move them around the screen. If you're experiencing any problems, issues, refresh your console by pressing the F5 key on your keyboard in Windows or Command plus R if on a Mac, or refresh your browser if you're on a mobile device, or close and relaunch the presentation. You can also view the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget in the bottom dock. If you think of a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box and click on the submit button. You do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting questions. You can download a copy of these slides by clicking on the resources widget in the bottom dock. The session is being recorded and will be archived for on-demand viewing in the next one to two days. Information on future and past webinars can be found at these two links. Today's presentation is Gender in Open Source Software Development by Alexander Silbernick. Let me introduce my dear friend Alexander first. He is a full professor of soft, social software engineering at the Software Engineering and Technology Cluster at Eindhoven University of Technology. Alexander's research goal is to facilitate the evolution of software by taking into account social aspects of software development. His work tends to involve theories and methods, both from within computer science, for example, the theory of socio-technical coordination, methods from natural language processing, machine learning, as well as from outside of computer science, like organizational psychology. The underlying idea of his work is that of empiricism. That is, addressing software engineering challenges should be grounded in observation and experimentation and requires a combination of the social and technical perspective. Alexander has co-authored a book, Evolving, social, um, sorry, Evolving Software Systems, and more than 100 scientific papers and articles. He is actively involved in organization of scientific conferences as member and chair of steering committees, General Chair, Program Committee Chair, Track Chair, and PC Member. He has also won multiple Best Paper and Distinguisher uh, Review Awards and is a member of the editorial board of several journals. Alexander is a senior member of IEEE and a member of ACF. So Alexander, without further ado, let's take it away. So Dia Anita, thank you very much for introducing me. Thank you very much, Venera, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me to talk to you about one of my favorite topics in software engineering research, and named the gender in open source software development. So why would we like to look at gender in software development? And the reason is essentially very simple. Software development is a collaborative activity, uh, not dissimilar to the uh, Harvard we see on the etching of Nicholas Peters on Berham. Um, where we see essentially people of different genders working jointly towards a shared goal. Of course, in case of software development, uh, the goal is slightly different, but we still need to uh, understand uh, experiences and uh, ways of working of different individuals, and in particular individuals of different genders, when we are looking at software development. So this research uh, can be positioned uh, in the context of so-called social software engineering research, where we are trying to understand how uh, who developers are and how do they work together influence both the process 
of software development and the resulting product. We typically consider variables of four levels. We think about individual attributes of an individual of a software developer, such as their gender or tenure or um, their uh, ethical background or age or anything like that. Once we move from individual to teams, we can talk about diversity with respect to each one of those individual attributes. Team composition can be expected to influence the process the team is going through, for instance, how productive the team is, or um, are there uh, many people leading the uh, team and joining it, or are there uh, suboptimal communication patterns, such as, for instance, a black cloud. So a black cloud is a suboptimal communication pattern, so-called community smell, where there is so much communication going on that participants cannot distinguish useful information from the user's one, signal from no. And finally, of course, we can talk about the product itself. Uh, we can talk about software metrics. We can talk about code smells, and so on and so forth. And in some of our recent studies, we have established relations between those um, variables. So, for instance, we have seen uh, that um, gender is related to duration of engagement or to tenure of individuals in open source projects. We have also seen that gender diversity is beneficial for productivity <coughs> and reduces likelihood of negative commu uh, communication patterns. In its turn, those negative communication patterns can be related to negative ways of organizing source code, which we know as code map. So in the coming slides, I'm going to show some of those studies in slightly more detail, and then we are going to uh, take a look at how we usually conduct those studies. So the first study was related to diversity in software teams and its impact on productivity. Of course, diversity a priori can be both beneficial and detrimental. On the one hand, we know that um, people tend to prefer working with others who are similar to them in terms of values, beliefs, and attitudes. We also know that people tend to categorize themselves in specific groups, and members of all groups are treated better than outsiders. So if you are familiar with um, the Harry Potter book series, you might uh, recall that uh, the students of Hogwarts are classified in four groups, and members of the same group or the same house are treated much, much better than members of the other house. On the other hand, we do see benefits of diversity. So for instance, uh, diverse, diverse problem solvers tend to outperform high ability problem solvers. And this is all about resources. Because if my resources are very, if I am very similar to you, then my resources are very similar to yours. So sharing those resources doesn't really increase uh, my ability to benefit from them. Uh, of course, if they are very different, then you have your resources. I have my resources. They are very different. So once we share, you get access to my resources, I get access to your resources, and both of us are benefiting from it. And we also know that multicultural social networks tend to promote creativity. So when we've been uh, looking at software development teams, it was not a priori clear what kind of impact of diversity we should expect. And um, it turned out that uh, controlling for things like team size, overall project activity, project age, and so on and so forth, gender diversity is beneficial for productivity, which back then was operationalized as a number of commits per quarter per time unit. And for mid size and large teams, tenure diversity is also beneficial for productivity. What do we mean by tenure diversity? Tenure here is duration of engagement in a specific project. So um, tenure diverse teams are teams which involve people who joined very recently and people who are contributing to this project for a um, long period of time. 
We have also seen that um, tenure diversity uh, is positively associated with turnover, while no such relationship could be established for gender diversity. Essentially, it means that if you have a team which is involving people of widely different uh, experiences in the project, then indeed such a team will be very productive, it will produce a lot of work, but this team will not survive. And at the next period of time, lots of people will be leaving and lots of new people will be joining. So this is not the case, at least you could not find this relation for gender diversity. Another study I have already mentioned in the beginning is a study of relationship between uh, gender-related variables, suboptimal communication patterns, and suboptimal source code organization. So on the left, we see those gender-related variables, such as gender diversity index, number of women, and so on. In the middle, we see those suboptimal uh, organization patterns, communication patterns. Uh, I've already mentioned black cloud. And on the right, we see traditional code map. So let me show you, or let us focus on one of those examples, right? So lone wolf is a situation when a software developer is essentially working alone and does not communicate with their teammates. We have found that lone wolf is associated with um, spaghetti code. So what does it mean if I am working alone and I don't think about that my source code will be um, needed or used by anybody else? Of course, I'm just organizing it in the way it fits me. I would probably be less inclined to think about how less familiar people would be uh, looking at my source code. And this can be associated with uh, spaghetti code, essentially, uh, code going all over the place. We also see that some of those um, suboptimal organizational patterns are associated with uh, gender diversity and some of them with number of women. So number of women is important here because uh, this essentially means that even when women are outnumbered, so when diversity index, uh, which combines number of women with number of participants in, of any gender, so gender diversity index would be low, uh, so even when women are outnumbered, they can act as mediators against proliferation of specific community smells, and specifically community smells which are associated with suboptimal communication. So, for instance, radio silos, right? Uh, situations uh, when there is a unique boundary spanner, essentially when we have groups of people, uh, and the communication between those two groups can be completely silenced by a single person. So I have shown you a couple of those examples of those studies. We are going to see more of those studies uh, later on. Um, but essentially, all of them are assuming that we are somehow talking to people and we are somehow analyzing large amounts of data. So for instance, in this study uh, of uh, diversity, uh, gender diversity versus productivity, they have looked at 23,000 projects uh, from GitHub which involved almost 700,000 developers and more than 10 million uh, commits. But of course, this is not enough because merely by analyzing the data, we can observe what is going on, but we cannot know what is going on. Uh, so we need to talk to people. So this is why we typically um, combine large-scale data analysis with surveys of interviews. For instance, in this very same study when we talked about teams on GitHub, we had first of all to figure out what a team would even mean, because of course on GitHub, um, this notion of a team is much less defined than uh, in a traditional um, company. So how do we actually do it with gender, right? I mean, 23,000 repositories, how can the, uh, and six, uh, almost 700,000 developers, how do we know of what gender they have. And of course, before we are going to the discussion of what techniques can be used to identify gender, we need to remember two things. So first of all, gender is a complex social construct. And it means that any kind of detection 
whether manual or automated, we'll be making some kind of simplified assumption, um, whether in collecting the data or interpreting the data. And of course, we do not talk about biological text. Another topic which we need, another thing which we need to be aware of is the topic of privacy. Because gender is a highly privacy sensitive topic and software developers uh, have numerous very valid reasons not to disclose their gender. For instance, many women who are active on uh, this kind of open source platform prefer not to disclose their gender due to safety concerns. Some projects and, and some companies might be reluctant to disclose how many women are involved in their uh, organization, either because they don't know or because uh, they uh, would like to appear more gender diverse than they actually are. So the first group of topics we are going to discuss, which is related to uh, identifying of gender, would be related to talking to people, meaning conducting surveys and conducting interviews. And in 2004, Bradburn uh, and um, uh, his co-authors have published this highly influential uh, guide on questionnaire design. And in general, it's a very well known and quite uh, valuable guide. But when it comes to asking about gender, the authors recommend to ask what's your sex or what's your main sex. And if this question is used as part of the survey, then there are two boxes, check boxes, male and female. So we already see that this book has appeared 17 years ago, which is actually not so long ago. But um, it makes quite a number of problematic uh, decisions. It conflates gender and sex, and of course, it uh, also offers only two options. However, from the survey of Stack Overflow and GitHub, and this number is based on recent Stack Overflow survey, we know that 1.2% uh, of soft of the respondents uh, do not identify either as men or as women. And this percentage might not appear that high, but if you compare it with the percentage of non-binary individuals among the population in general, again based on surveys, then it turns out that software developers, um, that among software developers, the share of non-binary people is three times higher than in population in general. It's a very important group. So when, when asking about gender, we should be aware of their existence. So Greta Bauer has proposed the following measurement instrument, the following question. Um, so it does not explicitly refer to uh, sex anymore, even though the word choice male and female is still commonly associated with sex rather than with gender. It has an option which is saying something else specified, so there is a way to provide more answers. But of course, it also others with search options, suggesting a certain preference for the first and second one. The problem with this instrument is that it's not really clear what it intends to measure. And in the follow-up study, it turned out that both trans feminine and trans masculine respondents have provided all three types of answers included in this yeah, item. And it's essentially not so surprising. What happened is that the respondents tried to figure out what the researchers wanted to hear, uh, was it related to um, birth uh, to sex assignment birth or to gender identity, they were reaching and they were reaching different conclusions. So this essentially undermines reliability of this measurement instrument. Moreover, when it is used as part of the interview, respondents report that this item is taxing and making them uncomfortable. So let's not use it. 
A better solution has been proposed by the um, human-computer interaction community, where a recommendation is, in general, to ask uh, open questions, like where do you identify on the gender spectrum, and allowing uh, respondents to provide any answer they like. Of course, there is a risk that some of those answers will not be valid in, in the sense that they, people might be trying to um, play a joke, um, or uh, that there is a cause of implication that we as researchers have to process those answers and manually code them. However, given a relatively small size of software engineering surveys, we're talking about 100, maybe 150 respondents, uh, surveys which are significantly larger are extremely rare. So the, the amount of work we as researchers need to put into processing this, for those answers does not outweigh the benefit for the respondent. However, the main problem the software engineering service is not so much in the amount of work we need to put into analyzing the results, but into the response rate. Response rate on software engineering surveys um, used to be between 10 and 20 percent. Unfortunately, uh, more recently, I, have, I, I tend to see even lower response rates being uh, reported by uh, software engineering researchers, in particular when it comes to uh, GitHub. And it's not that we don't have sufficiently many people to send their email. GitHub is huge. There are millions of developers. Um, and at least theoretically, if I want to um, have, uh, let's say, uh, 60,000 uh, respondents, I could have sent 300 to 600,000 mails. But of course, I'm not the only one. And if everyone is, every researcher is going to send 600,000 invitations, then uh, GitHub developers will be even more fed up with uh, our survey um, than they are already, essentially reducing this response rate and uh, questioning uh, the validity of this kind of data. So this is why. Um, all kinds of automated tools trying to get genders come into picture. And again, a word of caution, whatever tool you are going to use, uh, you are going to um, assume that self-presentation and artifacts created can be used to infer gender. It's an assumption. If you do not believe in it, then you cannot use any of those automated tools. And essentially, the only thing you could do is go and ask people, as we have been discussing so far. So roughly speaking, those automated tools fall into three categories, name to gender, face to gender, and artifact to gender. So the basic idea of name to gender is that, indeed, uh, certain names are more commonly associated with uh, people of a certain gender in different countries. So here you see a fragment of the map of Europe with most commonly uh, used names for women and for men. Um, of course, it's slightly more tricky than that because, for instance, we know that uh, the name Andrea is typically associated with men in Italy and with women, for instance, in Germany. Um, we do know that people uh, move around uh, and not necessarily live in countries where uh, they've been born. Essentially, they, their first name might be interpreted differently uh, in the country where they live as opposed to in the country where they've been born. So this is why uh, more advanced name-to-gender tools either take into account the geographic location of the individual or their surname, and they're trying to interpret the surname um, as essentially an indication of culture and then use this culture and related information to infer, interpret gender associations of a certain name. The second group of tools 
uh, try to identify um, gender based on the profile image. In this case, we see uh, an example of face plus plus. I mean, there are, even, there are more such tools, and you see that essentially, for me, for instance, um, um, the uh, gender was correctly identified. And finally, the last category uh, assumes that uh, uh, people tend to write text in different ways. Um, and if we uh, know how people of different genders tend to write text, we can also infer gender from the way text is being written. So this kind of argument is usually made uh, for much more personal writing than source code. Think about blogs, think about literature. But even for source code, there are attempts to identify um, um, uh, authorship based on the source code, the so-called steganography problem, and if we know who this person is, then we are likely to know their genders. But of course, all those tools have their limitations. And the first of those limitations is accuracy. So Kruger and Herman have evaluated different text for gender tools. And for different data sets, its accuracy range between 62 and 93%. And the highest percentage, 93%, was achieved, if I remember correctly, for novels, which is a very, very different kind of writing compared to source code. When it comes to name to gender, then uh, Chu et al. have evaluated different name, gender tool, name to gender tools uh, with accuracy between 60 and 84%. And this accuracy varies greatly for different kinds of names. So for instance, uh, for um, Eastern Asian and Southeast Asian names, accuracy tends to drop significantly compared to Western names. Another thing, another concern is reliability. As I already mentioned, a uh, significant share of women active on platforms such as GitHub uh, preferring not to disclose their gender. And in this particular case, uh, the respondent to one of our surveys has indicated that they used a fake GitHub handle as not to disclose their gender. So of course, presence of this kind of practices um, will confuse any kind of automated tools uh, and essentially mean that uh, we will no longer be able to uh, from reliable guessing. And of course, gender binary. The same study of Kruger and Herman uh, has shown that all approaches that are trying to identify gender based on text assume gender binary. In the study of all keys, uh, more than 90% of uh, state the gender tools assume gender binary. Uh, for names, it is slightly more complicated than that because tools which are matching names to gender tend to report numbers on a certain range between 0 and 1, between minus 1 and 1, but it's not so much related to um, those tools knowing that gender is not binary, but rather with confidence. So it's an indication of how confident the tool is in its own guessing. So for instance, now store which one of those two will uh, say minus one is the tool is completely sure that it's a man, one is a woman, and zero simply means the tool doesn't know anything. It doesn't mean that the tool is somehow aware of other gender options. So whatever tool we are using should of course depend on the research questions we want to get answered. Sometimes uh, talking to people through interviews and surveys is more beneficial. Sometimes automated tools make um, uh, that have the right of existence. So we need to decide what we want to do depending on what kind of questions we want to get answered and not only on the benefits of those tools. So going back to our picture I have already shown in the beginning. We see, you know, gender diversity is good for productivity, has no uh, associations with turnover, reduces uh, suboptimal communication. Ultimately, gender diversity is good, right? So this means everything should be great. We should be um, seeing 
lots and lots of people of any genders in computing and specifically in software engineering. But of course, this is not true. So I have collected here several uh, re percentages reported. Um, I don't uh, want to claim that this is a complete overview. Uh, but you see that um, very often percentages of women are low and percentages of women in open source development are even lower than in software development in general. And what makes it even worse than this, uh, the last, this smaller diagram comes from the Netherlands, which is a country where I work. Um, if you look at percentages of women in higher education, then the situation is not getting any better. So blue is computer science and science is STEM. So it's not, you know, a generic STEM problem. There is a specific problem of computing which makes it worse than um, that, um, STEM in general. So what have we tried to do? We have tried to uh, start um, do something about it. So we have found uh, a project called the Beauty and Drive Computing coming from Berkeley, uh, which is a computing program uh, for secondary school kids. And it has been uh, shown to be uh, successful in attracting non-traditional computing students, especially women, but also people who are all the kinds of uh, non-traditional computing students, and essentially we have translated it to Dutch, and essentially uh, we are supposed to be deploying it currently in Dutch schools. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it of course um, has been delayed. So, of course, it's great that we are trying to attract women to our computing community. But attraction is not all. We also need to be able to retain, to retain people. We need to be able to create an environment where people would be uh, happy to stay around. And indeed, we see, and this is a study of Sophie Chu and her co-authors, that uh, women are not only a minority, but they also disengage faster. So for instance, we see in this plot that after 12 months, uh, Slightly around 70% of, after 12 months of being involved in the project, roughly 70% of men are still contributing to it, while for women this percentage is around 60%. So, what could be done about it is being involved in projects which are using different programming languages. So the reason for this is that by being involved in projects which are using different uh, programming languages, contributors are diversifying their skills, and at the same time, they're also being involved in different projects. So essentially, they're increasing the likelihood of meeting people and establishing connections with people. I'm not going to dive into how exactly this works um, through this lens of social capital, but essentially what I would like you to remember is that while in being involved in this kind of multilingual project is beneficial for contributors of every gender, after 12 months, uh, this becomes more beneficial for women than for men. And of course, there is more we can be talking about. What I would like to what I would like to discuss in the last part of my talk, and specifically today, because tomorrow is of course the International um, Day of Transgender Visibility, I would like to report uh, on a study we have conducted recently. Uh, we have talked to transgender software developers in order to hear about their experiences in software development communities. So this is a joint work with Dine Ford and with Reid Milevich. We have conducted uh, a series of semi-structured interviews with uh, three software engineers who are transgender women. 
Um, the interviews were pretty open, so we talked about things like professional identity management, uh, platform-specific barriers, safety, and so on. So we have reviewed those uh, recordings. Uh, we have extracted several themes. Uh, we have double-checked what we extracted with publicly available blogs of other uh, transgender women who are software engineers. And finally, we have performed member checking. So we went back to the uh, communities. Essentially, we talked. We, talk we have involved yet another transgender software, uh, transgender woman who is a software developer, to double check that we are not um, misinterpreting what we see. And the topics which emerged were three. The first one was related to control of identity disclosure. So essentially, the desire to be seen as presented. How is this related to platform? For instance, tech overflow has constrained expression of identity. So essentially, everybody can ask, if it could ask a question without even registering, or if registration is needed, the amount of information the platform requires from you is limited. GitHub used to be much more demanding in this respect, by not only requiring an email address, which is of course logical because otherwise it would not work, um, but also exposing this email address to the rest of the world. And Daniela Petruzalek in her blog post uh, explicitly stated that this control of identity disclosure, this being this possibility, this being uh, able to be seen as presented, it's not only an identity goal but essentially mean of self-preservation, given the amount of harassment um, transgender women experience online. The second topic was related to economically stable work. So here we see a platform called Bounty Source, uh, where, where people might uh, propose bounties, essentially propose tasks. And uh, developers can pick those tasks, those software development tasks, and Earn money. So the fact that this topic has emerged uh, is not so surprising uh, since we know that um, over the population in general, and specifically transgender Americans, tend to experience higher level of un unemployment, poverty, and homelessness than their cisgender, meaning non transgender peers. So the topic of economically stable work is extremely important. And the third topic was related to autonomy to disengage and re-engage, meaning that uh, if we are working online, as many software developers do, it's much easier to close the laptop and say goodbye as opposed to walk out of a company if you are uh, working in the office. So thinking about the three topics we have identified, the so control of identity disclosure, economically stable work, and autonomy to disengage, they are essentially possible because software developers tend to work remotely, at least many of them. So when this has been published, we have uh, put this wonderful quote on the slide. We believe that remote work offers a mechanism of control for identity disclosure and empowerment of software developers from any marginalized community because of course things which are working for transgender developers might also be working for people who do not want to disclose their identity for whatever reason. And then 2020 came. And of course in 2020 our perspective on remote work has changed quite dramatically. And so far, there are quite some studies related to um, software developers working from home due to the pandemic. Uh, and the quote which I found most impressive here is a quote of Shane O'Flynn, who is the head of engineering at Trident quoted in a wonderful paper by Denae Ford and her co-authors. We are doing very well. We are barely hanging in there. So this pandemic had a very, very different 
influence on different software developers. While some of them are thriving and some of others are barely managing. And again, gender is one of the variables that turns out to be influential in how people work remotely, how software developers work remotely um, under the current pandemic. So the only paper I'm aware that has explicitly looked at the working from home during pandemic through the gender lens is the study by Machado. And uh, I'm putting a huge Brazilian flag in the background simply because uh, not only is the study conducted in Brazil, but also to stress that the way different countries deal with pandemic, the way different cultures are working uh, with um, are inter are treating gender and people of individual of different genders are quite highly culture specific. So what I'm going to say now does not necessarily transfer to other countries or to other cultures. So Machado and uh, our co-authors have uh, reported that the main difference between how women and men experience working from home during the pandemic are related to the traditional gender role. So essentially when you are thinking about childcare and household chores, uh, which are being reported as primary interaction reasons for women much, much more often than for men. Um, moreover, when companies are trying to support working from home, they tend to support the concerns of men better than the concerns of women. So for instance, uh, when men are reporting um, problems related to interruptions due to environment, due to no Okay, so I hope I am back. I apologize for the interruption on the line. Uh, so this essentially when men are complaining that they cannot work due to interruption, companies tend to provide them with uh, better infrastructure, for instance, ergonomic chairs. However, they do not provide uh, anything adequate for women. So for instance, for women, a typical reason for interruptions would be related to uh, household chores and um, child care. Uh, if companies cannot provide any kind of mechanisms to support it, then of course working from home will be treating harder uh, women than men. So let us summarize this entire discussion. Discussion of gender uh, is of course part of the broader discussion on social software engineering and we are trying to understand how who we are as individuals and how we work together influence the software development process as well as the uh, products which are resulting out of it. Many studies which involve gender require identification of gender 
either by manual means or by automatic means. Both manual means and automatic means have um, their limitations and their advantages. But whatever means you use, we need to keep in mind that gender is privacy sensitive and the privacy of the individuals involved has to be protected. We have also seen that diversity on its own is not enough. So it's not enough to put two people in the room. They also need to be able to work together. Um, and of course, uh, we also need to remember that working from um, home, which turned out to be uh, highly beneficial for transgender women in one of the studies I discussed, can also uh, disadvantage people. So working from home can be both empowering for women and disadvantages. So thank you very, very much for your attention. I apologize for the uh, technical interruption, and it will be my pleasure to answer some of the questions. Uh, thank you, Alexander. So we have quite a few questions, so let's get started. Uh, the first question is, uh, do you think that if women rallied more and spoke out in groups and demanded better pay and respect, that it would make a difference in today's social and political climate? I think that yes. Um, of course, uh, I'm a software engineering researcher, so um, when talking about social and political climate, uh, my guess is as good as uh, anybody else's. Um, but uh, looking at the history um, of the feminist movement uh, in the 20th century and before, I can only say yes. It was beneficial for all of us. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, um, you know about the gender mag work and its facets, which are about problem solving, risk, self-efficacy, motivation, learning style, and information processing style. Do you know of any data on genders beyond men or women on any of these facets? We are trying to collect it for gender mag project, but there's little available information. It's, 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 it's extremely, uh, well, first of all, I do know the Gender Mag project, and Anita is one of the leading people behind the Gender Mag project, and I uh, really admire the work uh, uh, the uh, team uh, of Anita and Margaret Burnett is doing at Oregon State. Um, but it is tough. It is extremely tough. So the moment you are going beyond uh, the traditional uh, genders, uh, lots and lots of things are uh, underexplored or unexplored, uh, and when it comes to um, those um, aspects of gender mag, uh, I'm not even sure that those topics have been explored. It would be it would be very cool to check the literature, but I don't I can't name anything specifically. Thank you. And that last question was from Margaret Burnett at OSU, and I realized I should maybe call out the name and the. Um, Location. So, next question is by Bianca, Northern Arizona University. Do you know any strategy OSS communities can employ to reduce the challenge of work-life balance for women? Uh, well, thank you for this question. Usually, those, those strategies are related to a reduction of interruptions. Um, Part of those things are related to um, the context where women work. So, of course, if uh, homeschooling uh, is the only option you have and there is nobody who can uh, support this homeschooling except for the woman herself, then it's unsolvable, whatever the open source community can do. Um, but in general, uh, things which the community should not do, they should not be uh, organizing all kinds of meetings uh, when those things can be avoided. And open source communities do have their share of meetings. And the next question is from Lily Frank Eidenhoven. Do you think it would be useful to standardly ask for preferred pronouns on these platforms? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, the, um, as usual, right? Um, 
the less information those platforms demand, the better. So I would not be in favor of making uh, the preferred pronouns mandatory, but I would be in favor of providing means of uh, expressing preferred pronouns. Okay. Um, Sam Hatfield, Washington University. Is there any research on the effect of codes of conduct on participation in open source projects? Thank you, thank you, thank you for this question. So we have studied code of conduct. There's also a study of decorum. Uh, but studying, in, uh, so the expectation is, of course, that code of conduct makes the communities more welcoming. Uh, and uh, one would expect to see uh, more uh, women, more active women, more representatives of uh, other minorities. But um, as far as I know, this has not been formally investigated. I mean, I have a master's student who is looking at exactly this topic right now. Cool. Um, next question is Ariel Fox, Open Source Design. Do you feel like the idea of open source as purely a developer coder endeavor would could play into gender diversity too? So if open source welcome more uh, project managers, marketers, designers, etc., OSS gender diversity would be better served. Um, yes and no. So first of all, I like, why, why no? Because I don't agree that uh, open source is a purely developer endeavor. Uh, if you look at uh, a large community such as OpenStack, we see roles which are related to governance, which are related to evangelization, which are related to numerous tasks, which are not necessarily coding related. And we also see that there are more women in those roles as opposed to uh, classical um, coding tasks. But of course, other, so this was the part why no. The part why yes, I do agree that uh, if open source project would be able to uh, present themselves, not purely as a technical endeavor, but for instance, as a way of changing the society and engaging all kinds of people with all kinds of backgrounds, then they are more likely to involve people who are not necessarily attracted to technology and in to increase gender diversity as a fact of it. Cool. Um, next question is by Orlando Mendez and don't know the company. His question is, of all the diversities, for example, gender, age, or ethnicity, which do you think is easiest to foster? Uh, what do you mean by easiest to foster? Which um, I believe uh, it is um, uh, get more diversity, I guess, like, you know, and engage more of those minorities to bring up the diversity. Uh, it, 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 it depends on your context, right? I mean, if you are talking, uh, I mean, open source projects, uh, they're not all the same, obviously. Um, if your uh, project uh, started uh, in country X, uh, and the entire communication in this project and in the source code uh, comments is in language of country X, then you are by definition excluding people who do not speak this language. So it's much, so it's the obvious thing it would be to fix uh, language and essentially open your project to people of different uh, nationalities, ethnicities, and so on. Um, if you are talking uh, about um, non-open source, if you're talking about companies, then uh, lots of companies uh, are uh, having a very, very strange attitude uh, towards age when essentially people uh, in their 30s and their 40s uh, are being seen uh, as being too old uh, and not fitting in their um, company climate. So yeah, one of the ways of fixing this would be uh, to uh, reduce uh, the communication which would stress uh, the use-related uh, attributes. So it depends on in what project you are. It depends on what context you are. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to fix. Sometimes it's much easier. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the next question is... 
I mean, it's hard because we can't have the follow-up question or clarification from the question asker. So, you know, we're doing the best we can. Um, next question from Brennan uh, Salmon Kensho. Have you investigated the extent to which community and code smells may impact the gender diversity of software engineering teams? That is in the opposite causal direction from the arrows in your diagram. No, we have not. Uh, so um, essentially, you are suggesting that uh, some of the source code can be uh, so unreadable that it kind of repels um, people of uh, a certain gender. This is kind of tricky, right? Um, I can imagine that it would um, repel uh, people who are not familiar with a certain kind of code or people who are not familiar with a certain kind of technology. But gender sounds tricky. When it comes to presence of community-related problems, then for sure uh, the um, you know, toxicity is a well-known phenomenon, so of course people would be leaving community, toxic communities. So there can be a direction, the arrows can be going in the other direction as well. Parking. Okay, thank you. Our next question, Preetha Chatterjee, University of Delaware. To ensure diversity, we can definitely focus on recruiting from underrepresented groups but how can we ensure that they're able to collaborate and work together as well? How can we build more inclusive environments? Well, this is, of course, a $1 million question. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to realize that uh, people of different groups might have different needs, and that um, this example of uh, working from home uh, shows this, uh, I think. And there, um, um, right, another example would be the slide I'm showing now, where you see uh, different uh, needs identified by uh, second flow participants. And you see that for women, so what should be improved by second flow? You see that women are talking about communication, right, rudeness, toxicity, uh, attitude, and so on. Uh, culture, while men are talking about technology, integration with GitHub, for instance, the discussion of the, you know, GitHub mobile, uh, sorry, flow on mobile platforms and so on. So different groups have different needs. That's one thing. Another thing is, of course, um, the topic of code of conduct, which has already been mentioned. So those things can contribute to a more inclusive environment. All right, cool. Uh, we are running out of time and we have more questions, uh, so hopefully you can answer them in writing. But let me ask one last question before we'll have to wrap up. Uh, Bridget Davenport from Navy, how do you think you could get more women to apply to STEM-oriented careers and how to overcome the jargon in job descriptions? So there are two questions here. Uh, one is how could we get more women to apply to STEM-oriented careers, uh, it's a leaky pipeline. So um, we need to um, talk to girls uh, from the very, very young age um, and essentially show them role models. Um, as long as uh, the, role, the only developers uh, young girls see are men, uh, it will be really, really hard to change the situation. When it comes to jargon in job descriptions, um, there are, of course, um, quite some uh, tools which try to uh, fix the uh, job descriptions, but success of those tools seem to be limited uh, because they are kind of uh, domain independent. So essentially, it doesn't matter whether you are hiring a software developer, a teacher, a nurse, or whoever, uh, those tools tend to, at least the tools I'm aware of, tend to capture the same kind of issues with language, which is kind of tricky because we do know that um, different domains have different communication uh, languages, communication styles, right? All right, thank you. So I'm afraid we have run out of time today, and I'd like to thank Alexander again for his informative presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. And a special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend 
and participate in today's webinar. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at the link down here. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and six software webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and www.sixsoft.org. On behalf of Sixsoft, the speakers, and myself, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.